All right, this is the lesson on animals. Now, before you get upset and think, gosh, there's a lot of animals on the planet, how are we ever going to know all about all of these animals? Understand that the EOC has uh, narrowed down the field of groups of animals to just four. Okay, so there's only four groups that you have to worry about. And I'm going to kind of highlight for you in this presentation what's important, but you also have a chart that you're filling out that helps you keep track of what's important. So I want you to focus on those two things. This presentation will help you fill out the chart. The first thing is what is an animal? And the definition of animal is that animals are multicellular consumers. Okay? They are also eukaryotic, which should go without saying, right? All of the protists, fungus, plants, and animals are eukaryotic, not prokaryotic. Animals have two body plans, the invertebrate body plan and the vertebrate body plan. The invertebrate body plan includes anything that does not have a backbone, which means there's no set body plan for an invertebrate. It can be anything from sea sponges to jellyfish to um, sand dollars to insects to earthworms. Uh, you know, there's all different kinds of invertebrates out there. And while some of them may look similar to, to others, um, you know, there's, there's just lots of ways that you could put together an invertebrate. So there's no definite invertebrate body plan. The vertebrate body plan, though, is not varied. It looks like this. Okay. Here's the bipedal version of that. Okay. Here is the quadrupedal version of that. Oops, and I forgot a tail. Hold on. There we go. Okay, so there should be a tail there. Okay, so let's talk about what you're looking at. What you have is a backbone in a vertebrate body plan, right? And there's the backbone here, right? Okay, so backbone, you have a head on one end of the backbone or spine. You have shoulders, and from those shoulders are appendages or arms, right? You have hips. From that, uh, those hips are legs, and then you have a tail, okay? Um, now, the, the only variation you're going to see is um, for snakes, for example, have lost these appendages, but they still have the bones inside of their body for them. Um, they have vestigial bones. Um, whales have vestigial hips uh, inside of their bodies as well. But for the most part, most vertebrates either look like this if they walk on two feet or this if they walk on four feet. Okay, so these are the four groups that you are responsible for, the annelid worms. Um, the reason why annelid worms are important is that these are the first with body segmentation. They also have a true body cavity, which is called a coelom, and that's how you spell coelom. It's a true body cavity. In other words, it's a body cavity that's completely lined with tissue. Um, and it's this segmentation that's an important evolutionary advance because it allows the uh, organism to contract one part of the body at a time. The muscles are in each individual segment as opposed to running the entire length of the body. Insects were chosen because they're a special class within phylum Arthropoda. Arthro means jointed. Poda means, uh, sorry, uh, foot, something like that. Uh, so they're the jointed feet. Um, they have jointed skeletons. Um, their skeleton, though, is an exoskeleton and it's a stiff exoskeleton, and it's made of a material called chitin, which does not grow with the organism. So you're going to see some molting with these guys. Amphibians, these were chosen because they're kind of the bridge between the fishes and the reptiles. So um, they, they have adaptations for both living in water and living in land. And then the mammals, and mammals are important because you're mammals. We're all mammals, but um, mammals feed their young with milk. Um, and they all are going to have hair or fur. All right, so let's start with the annelids. And I put a little picture of an annelid down here. Uh, our good old friend, the earthworm, is an annelid. And you can see the segmentation. You can see each of the little segments on that little worm. Annelids have a one-way digestive tract. In other words, food goes in the mouth, and it moves through the body toward an anus and out the anus. So it does not back up. It seems to us like a big fat duh, of course there's a one-way digestive tract because we have one-way digestive tracts, but understand in the animal kingdom not everybody has a one-way digestive tract. Um, we're going to see a group of organisms that doesn't, okay? 
You also have a closed circulatory system. And again, this is very much like yours in that blood is always enclosed in vessels. So it's either in an artery or a vein or a capillary or something. Um, it's a very primitive circulatory system, though. Um, so you don't have a heart. You have these five arches that go the length of the, uh, across the body, like right here. And those little arches pump. The oxygen that these guys get for cellular respiration happens through diffusion through the skin. There are no lungs here. So their skin is not waterproof. Um, their skin stays moist and they absorb oxygen through that skin. They have a ladder-like nervous system, meaning they have um, essentially um, two nerve cords, one on the back, one on the front, and then little nerves that connect the two. So if you were to look inside of this earthworm's body, that's what you would see. Food and gases and waste are carried by the coelomic fluid, so the fluid inside of the body cavity, as well as by blood, and they have the ability to get rid of liquid waste using a structure called nephridia. A neph means kidney. This is kind of like a primitive kidney. And they release that waste through little pores on the undersurface of the body called the nephridia pores. All right, so here's just more information for your chart. They're hermaphroditic, but they do do sexual reproduction. So in other words, they have both male and female parts. That's what hermaphrodite means. But they have to exchange semen or sperm in order to reproduce. So they can't fertilize themselves. Uh, and this kind of describes right here how it works. I'll let you read that on your own. Um, actually, this whole thing does right here. This is earthworm reproduction. Um, in terms of growth, new segments form behind the head and get pushed back. And these guys eat mainly dead organic matter from the soil. So they actually make soil. So um, soil is mostly stuff that's passed through an earthworm's gut. Um, and it, they enrich the soil, add more organic material to it. All right, insects. Um, insects have metamorphosis. And on the next page, I've got pictures of the two types of metamorphosis. So I'll let you read these here, but I'm going to explain them on the next slide because we didn't have room to um, go through all of this. They have open circulation. Now, this is different. They have a heart. It pumps blood, and most of the time the blood is in vessels. However, sometimes blood is just kind of dumped over the organs. Um, and washes over the organs. This is not a very efficient form of moving blood around the body. A closed circulatory system is by far much more efficient, but this works for insects. They also have a ladder-like nervous system, um, and they also have these structures called trachea, which are a series of tubes that run through the body, and at the end of each trachea is something called a spiracle, and again on the next page I've got a picture. Um, these are openings on the side of the body that lead to these trachea tubes and the air just kind of moves through the body that way so they don't have lungs and every time they beat their wings they actually are moving air through their body. They have an excretory system that consists of these things called malpigian tubes and malpigian tubes secrete potassium um, to make urine, right? But then they reabsorb that potassium which causes them to reabsorb water which allows them to release a solid waste which helps them to conserve water. Okay, so um, they kind of do this diffusion and osmosis thing where they secrete the potassium, then they pull the potassium or the salt back to try to conserve water. Um, you're going to see modes of communication here, including pheromones, um, which are chemical signals. Okay, um, you're also going to see um, dancing in honeybees, and we're going to get to that later on. Um, some of them develop social structures also, um, like ants and termites and bees that live in colonies. They have internal fertilization and they lay eggs. And while we're here, here are the pictures I promised you. So here is um, incomplete metamorphosis right here, incomplete. You start with an egg and through a series of molts. Remember I told you insects' exoskeletons don't grow. So when they get to a certain size and their skeleton won't grow anymore, they, their skeleton cracks and they shed it and then they grow a new exoskeleton. That's called molting when they do that. So through a series of molts, they just get bigger and bigger until they reach their adult form and that's called incomplete metamorphosis. 
Complete metamorphosis happens when you start with eggs and there's a larval form that goes through something called pupation. And that's like with butterflies where they go into a cocoon for a while. And they complete their metamorphosis inside of the pupa stage and emerge from the pupa stage as adults. So that's complete. So incomplete is here, complete is here. And here's a picture of an insect larva with those little holes that I was telling you about. Those are called the spiracles and that leads to the tracheal tubes. All right, next group is the amphibians. Um, so our little frogs and salamanders. Um, these guys are the most like the mammals, and you can tell we're getting more and more complicated here as we go. So you can see their characteristics. Here is metamorphosis down here. Okay, so the metamorphosis in amphibians is different from metamorphosis in insects. Um, you, you know about tadpoles, right, and how they grow, and they grow, and eventually they sprout legs to become frogs, and they lose that tail. And what happens is the, the tail itself gets dissolved or eaten by the body. Basically, enzymes kind of break it down and convert the tail material into legs, okay? So it gets kind of recycled into legs until you get to the adult form. These guys have a three-chambered heart and a closed circulatory system. Um, and uh, we'll get into that on the next slide because I ran out of room for pictures here. But again, stuff for your chart is listed here for you. All right, so here is an amphibian heart, and what's important is that it only has three chambers. Here's one, here's two, and here's three. The reason why this is important is it's, it's a little less efficient than the heart that you have because blood gets pumped into the top part of the heart, right? It goes out to the lungs to get oxygen, and when it comes back, it's pumped into this bottom chamber, and that bottom chamber is going to contain some oxygenated blood as well as deoxygenated blood. In other words, when blood gets pumped into the heart and it comes down here and then leaves to go to the lungs and comes back, it's coming back to the same chamber, so you're going to get some mixing which means your blood is not totally oxygenated or totally deoxygenated. Um, so it's a really inefficient heart system. It works for them, but it wouldn't work for something that has a lot of energy for a high energy organism. Okay, mammals. This one you should be the most familiar with, right? Um, these guys um, are what we are, and this is you know, gonna have all the things that you have. Body is covered with hair, although we are an ape that's lost most of our hair, but other organisms have it. And by the way, fur and hair are no different. Uh, they're the same thing. We just like to call our stuff hair, and we like to call what other animals have fur. They have mammary glands, which are modified sweat glands that produce milk uh, for feeding the young. They also have scent glands for communication. They have a four-chambered heart, and here's the four-chambered heart. So when blood enters and then goes into this lower chamber and leaves to go to the lungs, when it comes back to the body, it goes back to a different chamber where there's no mixing. Okay, so one, two, three, four. This is a much more efficient heart to have. They have a highly developed brain and nervous system, advanced digestive and endocrine systems, um, so really advanced group. There are three groups of mammals. Um, the first of these is the marsupials, which I've got a picture down here. Most of them, I'm pretty sure all of them, live in or around Australia. Um, the kangaroo you're probably the most familiar with, um, but there are little wombats and uh, little marsupial moles and, and other things like that. Um, so these produce, uh, they, give, they actually do give birth to a young, but the young are really, really underdeveloped. They look like a tiny little fetus. And they emerge from the uterus really early and go into the mom's pouch and uh, attach there to a nipple and stay there until they develop a little bit more. And then they can leave and come back for a long time. Um, monotremes are egg-laying, which the word for that is oviparous, okay? And these are the monotremes here, the platypus and the echidna. Platypus you're probably familiar with. This is also called the, the spiny anteater. Um, there. So those guys, so they lay eggs, but they also do produce milk um, and they do have hair, so they're considered mammals. And then the last group is the eutherians. The eutherians are the ones that have live birth. They're also called the placental mammals um, because their young is attached to the mother while uh, she's pregnant to her body via the placenta, and we've talked about the placenta before. Um, this is the most diverse group, obviously, so here's just a, a sampling of, of different eutherian mammals here.